after losing Jadavian Clowney to the Carolina Panthers, is it now Kyle Van Noy or bust at the S position for the Baltimore Ravens? All that and more come up next year on this episode of Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, coming to you from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you so much for being here today and making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every single day. Free and available on podcasting platforms. That includes a video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your shows. Be sure to subscribe, follow along the whole nine yards, bring you five days a week plus more of Ravens content. Today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning final bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. We are back. It is a Taco Tuesday episode coming the day after April Fool's. So we're recording this still. It's still April Fool's right now. And I had to bring my guy back on here, Jake Luke of Exit 52, to talk some Ravens football Jake, I don't think I saw any crazy April Fool's jokes. Did, did you see anything that, that like that got you or that you saw was believable in the sports world? No, I think it's just so like baked into my consciousness now. Like I've been on Twitter long enough where like maybe five years ago that stuff started to get me. But I, I, I don't know. I just feel like these days it's kind of like you're not even really that original anymore if you're doing like April Fool's social media stuff. It's almost kind of passe at this point. Yeah, there's a, there was actually one crazy one. You know, the account overtime has like the gold check mark and everything, like one point something million followers. They posted that Caitlin Clark was out for the Iowa LSU game, and it, it, they did it as an April Fool's joke. But everyone's like, "You doing that? Having one point three or whatever million followers and a gold check is like Loki kind of crazy." That's going to move betting lines. I mean, that's like, it's, it's also like not even a joke. Like it's hard to like, when I think April fools, I think like pranks a little bit. I think of this kind of stuff, like all this stuff is just like casual deception. I'm not really into it. There's yeah. not a lot of creativity and it's just kind of a, a gotcha. And like, what's the payoff to that? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit of a snob with my humor, but I'm not into it. You know, the one, and I always put this out every April fool's day is the Ravens actually did a real, well, first of all, the Ravens tried to, to get the players with uh, bringing back the gold or mustard pants. And I think Patrick Ricard put it out there first and all the, the players figured it out, but that was the Ravens April fool's joke for this year. But the one in 2017 the, my favorite one is when the Ravens were going to Jacksonville to play that game in London. Now the game was not my favorite. It was a disaster, but John Harbaugh and the media team made this whole elaborate video. Players were tweeting about it, that the team was going to take a seven day ship to London, travel to London on a ship, and they'd have a full 100-yard football field in there, seven days of bonding. It got a lot of people because they didn't advertise it as an April Fool's joke at first. But that, to me, that one was one of the better ones I've seen. You know, with the way that game turned out, maybe they should have just done that. You know, (laughs) couldn't have hurt. Yeah, wouldn't have. Game might have gone a little better, honestly. I don't think they could have done anything worse. So April Fool's is always something to me where I agree with you. It's just like, I'm so prepared for it at this point where like I always have to double and triple check. You, you see like the fake Adam Schefter accounts and Ian Rappaport accounts doing their thing. But I feel like that was more so like the first year or so of Musk Twitter where everybody could just buy the verification check marks and they were getting everybody. But people I think are used to it at this point. I feel like we're used to it on Twitter on any day at this point with all that's going on with, uh, <laughs> since that, since that acquisition that you mentioned, I, you know, I, I I'm kind of, I'm always sort of, you know, waiting to see someone or something lying in the weeds to just try and deceive me in one way or the other. So it's, we're in a post truth world in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, uh, I, people get got whether it's April fool's day or any other day throughout the year, no, nothing new there, but all right, Jake, let's talk Ravens. I think the talk of town right now, I've been talking about it here on locked on Ravens for last couple episodes. It's the Ed's position. I think there's a lot of worry within the fan base right now about how the Ed's position looks because Jadavian Clowney goes to the Carolina Panthers. Now, that was a two-year, $20 million deal worth up to $24 million. Baltimore was never going to be in that price range. They they, they just couldn't afford that with a guy like Clowney. But 
I think it's kind of set the panic meter off for some people because a lot of fans were anticipating, okay, yeah, maybe one or both of Kyle Van Noy or Jadavian Clowney come back. One guy's off the market and historically early for Jadavian Clowney, by the way. He has never signed a deal before training camp in free agency. But look, when you're getting offered $10 million per year, he's like, all right, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll make an exception for that. But the list of guys who are left in the free agent pool, Jake, it's not not necessarily inspiring, I'll say. It's players that have had good careers but are maybe on the downswing or others that have shown potential but not necessarily guys you would trust in a full-time role. So I'm, I'm pulling up the list quickly here. But at this point, it's guys like, Emmanuel Ogba and Carl Lawson, Randy Gregory, old friend Tyus Bowser, Jerry Hughes, Justin Houston, Bud Dupree, Shaq Lawson, Marcus Golden, Anthony Boyer, Bruce Irvin. But the headliner of that list is Kyle Van Noy. Is this essentially Kyle Van Noy or bust for you in terms of bringing in a guy? I would say, yeah. I mean, like he's familiar with the system. He's obviously got a great temperament. He seems like he would be a good locker room leader in what might be a little bit of a rebuilding uh, year on the defensive side of the ball with the new coaching staff coming in. So, I mean, he would definitely be the name at the top of my list, but like, or bust is tough because like, I don't know, like, it's going to be hard to like get the same production out of not only him, but out of a lot of these guys that you got out of Clowney, who, by the way, I wouldn't be surprised to see get maybe a nebulous kind of nagging soft tissue injury as those uh, workouts start to come around in Carolina. Um, and then maybe he'll just miraculously be ready for week one. So we'll see what happens there. But yeah, I don't know. It, it just seems like it's going to be hard to have lightning strike twice at that position, but I would be all for bringing Van Noy back. Cause I don't think it's going to be that expensive. You know, he wants a little bit of a pay raise and deservedly so, but I don't know if I were them, I'd just try to get that thing done and then turn my attention to the draft and get younger at the position and hope you get something out of uh, David Ojabo this year. Yeah. And I think the other argument is, well, Clowney and Van Noy last year were kind of like, all right, are their careers over at this point? What do they still have left in the tank? They come to Baltimore and they have career years. So maybe for a guy like a Bud Dupree or uh, I don't know, Randy Gregory, could could they make that magic happen again? But I think with Van Noy, it's just more of a sure thing where you're right. He's been in the system. He's familiar with the defense. I think to me, that's the, the no brainer option. And he is, I think, the best player on that list by a pretty wide margin at this point. But in terms of the guys who are on the roster at this point, Jake, it's Adafi Owe, it's David Ajabo, Tavius Robinson, Malik Ham, a lot of inexperience where Adafi Owe has shown us flashes, but he hasn't fully, fully put it together in a pure breakout yet. Ajabo has potential, but can't really put all your eggs in that basket considering the injury history for him over the first two years of his career. What's your confidence level in the edge group right now as it currently stands on the roster? Yeah, it's not super high, and it's also like not super high as far as sack production goes because you've got Clowney leading that group more or less with the uh, nine or so sacks that he had last year. I mean, that's those are solid, very good numbers, and especially with the role that he played, I think that's that's very good for what you got out of him. But you don't really have that guy, and they really haven't had that guy in the Terrell Suggs mold since Terrell Suggs, a guy that can line up over you know either side of the tackles, beat a guy one on one, and get double digit sacks. You know, as kind of his benchmark, haven't had it in a while. Um, Judon, you can certainly make an argument, and we'll, we'll see what happens with his status in New England. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that as well. So, yeah, I think you just keep an eye on the market. If you want to bring back Van Noy, I'm all for it, but none of these guys are really moving me. You know, you mentioned a lot of the names. You can maybe throw like a Derek Rivers in there who's a little bit on the younger side. I don't know. There, there, there are guys out there, but nothing is really moving me as of right now. So, Would you be open to a Judon trade reunion for Baltimore? I probably would. I don't have his salary numbers right in front of me, so I wouldn't want it to be like super expensive or anything, but I don't see why not. I mean, it, there might be a certain ESPN reporter uh, in the area who wouldn't be all for that, uh, which we don't have to get into. But overall, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like he could come back here and live out sort of what would probably be the back nine of his career. And uh, he's still been productive there in New England. And obviously it doesn't look like they're going anywhere fast as far as the Super Bowl goes. So if he does want to get a ring, you know, there are worse places to go than Baltimore. I wouldn't consider them the favorite necessarily, but uh, they were right there last year. And I figure they'll at least be in the playoffs this year again. So, yeah, I think this is, this is the last year of that deal for him. So maybe if it's free agency next year, I think a lot of people miss that Marlon and Judon bromance kind of giving us those memeable moments and, talking about the mac and cheese or cheese noodles, I guess, if you if you want to take it from Marlon's perspective. But I think Judon would be an interesting one. He's proven he's a guy that obviously has continued to increase his production in New England. I wouldn't be shocked if he's made – maybe he's a trade deadline piece where they might move him at the trade deadline, try to get some picks. 
especially if their season does not go the way of the playoffs, which I don't think really anybody's expecting it to this year. But what do you think, Jake, about your expectations for both Adafi Owe and David Ajabo? Where are you right now on those two? And what do you need to see from them to for them to give you that full confidence? I mean, really with Owe, like you when you listen to people that know what they talk about, they're talking about, it seems like everything's kind of there except for the sack production. A very solid player, very athletic, as we already knew coming out of Penn State there. It's translated in that sense, uh, coming over from college, but it really is just a sack production. So if he can turn into like a seven, eight sack guy this year and really set himself up for a nice payday, I mean, that wouldn't totally shock me because like, you know, it feels like it's all there except for the sack production. And the Ravens have said that's not the only thing they value. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for him uh, getting the shot and getting a little bit more playing time and seeing what he, what he can do with Ojabo, man, it's just such a such a wild card at this point you know best of, of ability is availability and that's really he just hasn't been able to show that at all in his career and you know the one time he really does get significant playing time he goes out there and gets a strip sack on joe burrow so it's just enough to give you that kind of tantalizing feeling of like ah maybe this guy could turn into what he was at michigan he's probably never going to do that uh but i don't know you, you keep him in the mix and see what you get out of him this year but you certainly shouldn't be relying on him i don't think if you're trying to trying to win games Right. And that's where I think, again, we will see Baltimore try to add, I'd probably assume one veteran and one draft pick. I don't know in what round that draft pick will come in. We're going to talk about a little more in the final part of the show, but coming up in the second part of Locked on Ravens, we're going to be talking a bit about Baltimore's free agency so far and the approach they've taken. Stay tuned. We got a lot to dive into on Locked on Ravens. First, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Therapy has a ton of benefits from learning positive coping skills to how to set boundaries. It can even empower you to become the best version of yourself. And it isn't just for those who experience major trauma. It's for everyone. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. We're back for our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with Jake Luke. First, I want to... First, shout out the kind messages I got in the comments for yesterday's show. I made it clear I was feeling under the weather. Actually, I, I told Jake before getting on here, woke up with a 101.4 fever yesterday. Went to 102 one today when I woke up, so we're moving in the wrong direction. We're not, not the right direction, but of course the show goes on, and I appreciate Jake for hopping on with me to uh, chop it up Ravens-wise. But Jake, let, let's talk about free agency because – Everybody gets so excited for it. And then the Ravens way is they kind of let things play out over the first day. We rarely see them make a first day move, but that's when all the action happens. And everyone's like, when are the Ravens going to make a move? And I think what kind of added insult to injury was the fact that I think five or six Ravens signed elsewhere on the first day too. So everybody was like, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, but then you have Derrick Henry come in. So let's start there. How did you like the Derrick Henry signing? And what do you think it brings to this offense? Because people are saying, well, the Ravens rushing attack was already the strength of the team. Why would you go out there and spend $8 million per year on a running back? And my argument is just because the Ravens had the top rushing attack in the league does not mean that it can't get better. Yeah, no, I like it a lot, um, especially from a vibes perspective. I mean, he's just one of those guys who feels like he should have been playing here his whole career. And obviously they had a chance at him in, uh, in the draft that he was in there. Uh, with the Titans getting him in the third round, I believe. So it, it could have happened and it didn't. And then, you know, obviously he uh, handed the Ravens their own backside a couple different times uh, over the course of a couple matchups over the years and turned into uh, one of those figures who, you know, you, you have a lot of respect for in the rivalry. It reminded me a lot of, you know, Eddie George when I was a, a young kid, uh, where it's like, man, I hate playing against this guy, but he's freaking awesome and I'd love to have him on the team someday. And it winds up happening. Weird fit, certainly, especially with what's transpired since. With them losing three of their uh, five starters along the offensive line, I mean that's kind of the key piece here. And the argument that everyone is making is like, well, 
They have that number one rushing attack. Why even go get this guy? Well, without those offensive line pieces in place, it's going to be even harder to be that number one rushing attack. So a weird fit from that perspective, but I'm sure they have a plan to rebuild that back up. And ultimately, like you can't tell me it's a bad thing when you're giving significant, you know, playoff snaps to um, to um, Justice Hill, who obviously who's a solid player. And then uh, Dalvin Cook, obviously, sign him off the street. I mean, like, they, it's just it, that can't happen again in a playoff game. I don't care your opinion on running backs don't matter, this and that. Like, it, it still has some value, no matter what your opinion on that is. And some of those guys, it just, it, it, and it feels like it continues to happen to them season after season where they're in this spot. It feels like they finally found a, uh, hopefully, at least a two year solution here with Derrick Henry at the position. And uh, I'll be excited to see the, uh, the fit. If nothing else, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and if nothing else also, they can't keep him on the sideline for the majority of the AFC Championship game. You can't keep a guy like that out. And so I think with Derrick Henry in the full – challenge them. Do not test them on that. Uh, yeah. yeah, look, six, six carries for Derrick Henry in an AFC Championship game might be even more blasphemous than what we saw. And I'm not saying that what we saw was not blasphemous. It was. But I also think you made that point there about, oh, some people are in the you know running backs don't matter. How much should you pay running backs in today's league? Look, I mean, Derrick Henry got the same amount per year that Tony Pollard got from Tennessee, that DeAndre Swift got from Chicago. You line those guys up and say, hey, go pick one. Derrick Henry's the better player by a decently wide margin, and he's getting paid the same amount as those guys. Plus, I just think from a from a deal perspective, it fit a little better than Saquon and Josh Jacobs because Henry, I think at this point, look, he's 30 years old now, and the priority for him more so is, hey, I want to go win. Where can I? Where can I be a fit? And so that to me makes it exciting, but you mentioned the offensive line too, Jake. I think it's a lot of, it's it's a worry spot for a lot of people right now. As you mentioned, those three starters are gone. John Simpson and Morgan Moses reuniting together on the jets. Moses gets traded there. And then Kevin Zeitler, who I think a lot of people expected back once the season ended, kind of felt like that situation every day that it didn't happen. He and obviously you don't get the dead cap hit off your books. He goes to Detroit that those are big holes on your line. You still have Tyra Linderbaum, Ronnie Stanley comes back, but how do you think they kind of work through this shuffle here? Because they have a lot to work out and figure out. Yeah. And I don't have the free agent list in front of me for that either. Um, and I guess we could go over it, but I I'd expect them to sign a veteran at one of these knee positions. I'd expect them to draft a guy highly at one of these knee positions. And then it's going to be a battle between guys like Ben Cleveland and guys like Andrew Voorhees, who, you know, have all the potential in the world for sure, but we talk about ability and availability, and we talk about some of the concerns with Ben Cleveland, maybe as far as the playbook and work ethic go. It's it's just kind of a tough gamble, but that's just kind of how it works out a lot of the time with the offensive line. It's tough to have really five really good starters along an offensive line, and it's very expensive. So sometimes you got to cut corners, and really, I mean, that's kind of what they did last year, right? They signed John John Simpson off the scrap heap, and he winds up being a solid player for them. Um, and you, you get 16 good football games out of him or 17, um, throughout the regular season. So, you know, maybe they're banking on getting one of those good bargain bin signings and getting some good football out of them. If their analytics are telling them that they could find a guy like that, I'm all for it, but yeah, I'm expecting two decent investments, one in the uh, free agent pool among guys that maybe are still available. Maybe you're going to have a cut. And then, uh, like I said, a high draft pick and they're going to rebuild this thing as they said they were going to. Yeah, it, it is going to be interesting, too, because with the whole Stanley conversation, John Harbaugh expressed confidence in him, saying, you know, he's recovering. And, and he did go through some injuries last year, as did Morgan Moses, and that's why they went with that rotation. But where are you on Ronnie Stanley right now? He revised that deal, actually helped the Ravens out a lot, and bet on himself. He essentially chopped off the last year of his deal, and – for him, for the Ravens, it's going to look like a new next year because he's a free agent. So the Ravens could resign him. They could not. But are you still confident that Ronnie Stanley, maybe not getting back to, to peak prime Ronnie Stanley, but at least being more serviceable and more consistent than we've seen? Yeah, I am. Because I think we saw stretches of it last year. And I mean, this was such a bad injury that it was always going to take a long time to come back from. Did we know it was going to take three seasons? I don't know that I did necessarily, but here he is. He's still in the mix. He's still fighting it out. And uh, listen, the guys, you know, got almost a hundred million dollars in his checking account just from direct deposit here, not counting everything else that he's made. I mean, I think it was really a, a good thing for him. And I think probably uh, it was a great thing for the team that he was able to come back to the table and say, look, I'm willing to take a little bit of a pay cut here. 
And uh, let's see if we can ride this thing out and rebuild the offensive line, as you guys have said. And, you know, I, I, it speaks well to him and his character that he did that. And also, I think um, it was needed. It was really needed because the play just did not match what he was making. But, uh, you know, overall, he, he he's going to be good to have and he's going to be good to have at a much lower number. It just needed to happen. And uh, I'm glad they were able to make it make it happen. Yeah, uh, 26.2 million was that original cap hit. And I agree with you where the, the play that he was giving out, the consistency, it was it was not worth that, but it's going to help the Ravens out in a bunch of different ways to this point. But what do you think about the approach they've taken? I know we talked a bit about it before we actually hopped on the recording, Jake, but how, how have you liked or disliked how Baltimore has kind of taken their free agency approach? Because they're only really big addition has been Derrick Henry, or I guess for John Harbaugh, Chris Board is another one because he, he loves special teams, yeah. but they've lost a lot of guys, a lot of guys. So there are a lot of holes they have to fill. And again, free agency is kind of, it, it's something that goes on for months and we're nowhere near the end. But at this point you, you have to wonder, all right, when are these other moves going to drop? Yeah, more or less fine with it because like a lot of those guys were kind of just hanging on the end of the roster to begin with, or they were young players like a Geno Stone who would, you know, bounce back and forth between the Ravens roster and elsewhere and finally settles in and turns turns himself into a ball hawk and gets a nice payday. You know, it's tough to lose a guy like that, but it's probably not going to be earth shattering, if, especially if Marcus Williams can stay healthy and they can finally start to get some good consistent football out of him. That'll be, uh, you know, I, I feel like people aren't going to miss Stone all that much. And then, you know, a lot of role players. Ronald Darby played some good football for them last year, but it reminds me of the offensive uh, or the outside linebacker thing where you got him off the scrap heap, right, in August. And uh, that's just how it goes a lot of the time. And, you know, you wind up retaining an Arthur Millette at the same position, who is a pretty similar story. I'd probably rather have kept Millette. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of guys that they did lose. And you mentioned Simpson. That's tough. But like I said, another guy they just got right off the scrap heap. And hopefully they're going to be able to do the same thing this year. So, I don't know. It just it's it's one of those things where I see people on Twitter or X or whatever kind of, you know, going after the cost of for some of these losses and stuff when it was all happening. And I don't know, it just didn't have it didn't feel as authentic. It didn't have that kind of full that same full throated rage that people would have in years past. I feel like they were kind of faking it a little bit this time around. You, you can't tell me that you're really this angry about losing some of these guys in free agency. It just it doesn't really hit the same. I feel like they're going to be fine without a lot of these players. Well, I, I think the, uh, the the Patrick Queen one, and it's also just the division rival stuff too, where very interesting year for uh, the Ravens and their phrases going to division rivals. You see Tyler Huntley go to Cleveland, Queen go to Pittsburgh, Geno Stone go to Cincinnati. And that, that villain stuff from Patrick Queen, I think made a lot of people definitely do some, some 180s when it comes, comes to him. And I'm excited. That first Derrick Henry, Patrick Queen meeting in the middle, that, that first meeting in the hole, literally might be like an earth shattering hit who wins it. I mean, I, I probably put money on Derrick Henry at this point, but if this queen is going to be watched under a mic, if he wasn't before watched under a microscope by Ravens fans, I think his comments now, every single play he, he's going to be watched under a microscope, especially in those Ravens Steelers matchups. Yeah. And I like Patrick a lot. Um, but ultimately I did think it was kind of funny and maybe a little emblematic of what we've seen from him over the years where he is kind of trying to play up that villain thing and like talk things up. But then, you know, he's talking about, Oh man, it's not like we, we players, it's not as big a deal to us as you fans are. You guys just don't get it. But then he's like on Twitter with a bunch of people just like, you know, still talking smack. You can tell like he cares a lot about it. And I wish he would kind of lean into that a little bit more and say like, yeah, you know what? Screw this. I do care. And I am going to come back into Baltimore and I'm going to stick stick it to you guys and you fans for not playing me and some of the uh, some of the hate he received over the years, I think fairly and unfairly in a lot of cases. Uh, it, it just adds a lot of juice to the rivalry. So it's cool. But yeah, I didn't mention him. He's obviously a tough loss. But you know, when everyone was freaking out about them drafting Trenton Simpson in the third round, there's your there's your plan to replace him right there. And he looked good in that uh that meaningless game against those same Steelers in week 18. So see what happens. You know, you're probably gonna have a little bit of a drop off there. And um, I don't know. It, it's just one of those things where you're gonna lose guys. It is weird to have a guy in his prime, a high profile player like that, cross the picket line and go over to Pittsburgh. You don't really see that a ton in this rivalry. So I don't know. I'm intrigued by it from a storyline perspective, but that's another position where I just think you got Roquan Smith and uh, whoever's going to be next to him, I think is going to be okay. Yeah. It, it's been a while since we've seen a player of that caliber move over to the other side of the rivalry. I mean, recently, obviously, Miles Boykin has gone from the Ravens to the Steelers. Alejandro Villanueva has gone from the Steelers to the Ravens, Arthur Millette, but obviously those three guys, not necessarily to the level Patrick Queen is playing at 
right now. But coming up in the final part of the show, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Ravens draft needs and talking about where they could go, which players and what positions they could be looking at with less than a month to go before the draft officially kicks off. Stay tuned. A lot to get to here on the show. First, this show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning final of bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tourney, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a big win. For me, I, I had a couple of big wins early in the NCAA tournament. Now I have UConn winning, so there's still a shot for me there, but all of my other Final Four teams are out. So it wasn't a great bracket for me, unfortunately. FanDuel America's number one sportsbook. We are back with Locked On Ravens. I am Kevin Ostriker. With me still is Jake Luke. And Jake, the draft, we know that Eric DaCosta absolutely loves the draft. I think there is nothing, and he actually said it. I forget what the podcast was. I can't remember the name, but he said that outside of his family, the draft is what brings him the most joy, and I do not doubt that for one second because of everything that he has done in the draft. He loves maneuvering up and down the draft board, and obviously the guy he was working under for so long, and as he knew some, he did some of those exact same things. Baltimore has the 30th pick, so not necessarily one of those super high up there picks. Baltimore doesn't usually have a super high up there pick. I think even them drafting up 14 a couple years ago was a little bit of an outlier for them. But at this point, I think you can identify the needs or at least the biggest ones is offensive line, corner, edge, even wide receiver. Are, are you kind of circling any one or even multiple of those as, as we head into the draft season? Yeah, I'd like them to get younger at tackle, finally. I mean, Stanley's obviously been a holdout there, but we've mentioned the consistency issues, and then it's just kind of it, – it's felt like Band-Aids at right tackle over the years until they finally settled on Moses, and he's by no means a world mover, but a, a good player, and he settled things down for them there, which is nice. Get a nice young option there, maybe in that first or second round. I think that would be really good. Um, and then wide receiver, like, there, there's just so many good, young, talented wide receivers. It's tough to see them go elsewhere, like, every single year. And I think, to Eric's credit, he's – Definitely invested more at wide receiver in the draft uh, than Ozzy ever did, I think. So I think they're probably going to have both those positions. I mean, I said tackle, but offensive line in general, have them circled uh, for, uh, for you know, the end of the month here. And then I think uh, receiver is one that I would continue to keep an eye on because losing Beckham, you know, it, it, he didn't give you a ton on the stack sheet necessarily, but I thought there was just a presence to him, a big playability that I think was really important to that team. And like I said, didn't totally show up on the stack sheet, but – you just you, you like to have a guy like that, uh, particularly in clutch situations. And I don't know. I just don't like the idea of downgrading from what Lamar Jackson had at pass catcher last year. Uh, I think it was just kind of the perfect mix. So keep throwing darts at the board at wide receiver. Definitely try to upgrade that offensive line. That's really what I'm looking at. Now, speaking of that, the Ravens, John Harbaugh has made it very clear that they do want to give their young guys an opportunity. And that means essentially what I think it means is Rashad Bateman getting that number two wide receiver job behind Zay Flowers and not bringing in players that would necessarily take away from those snaps for Bateman, but instead more so just complimenting him. Are, are you on board? Because obviously Baltimore went young in 2022 at wide receiver, and this is a different situation than then, but it was a disaster the last time they did it. Now I think they're better equipped this time around, especially just because Zay is there and that changes a lot of things. But are you on board with Bateman getting that role and how confident are you in him if he's able to have a full off season with Lamar? Cause it does seem like his first couple of years in the league, he's had to deal with an injury here, an injury there. And he just, he never gets to fully ramp up to the season or his momentum gets stopped. Yeah. It's, it's tough to bet on, I think. And that soft tissue stuff, like you can come back from it, but that stuff sticks around with you. You know, it causes degeneration uh, in the area of the muscles and the joints and the ligaments that they happen around. And it just makes you a little bit less durable, a little bit less explosive. You're a tick slower on your cuts. It, it just makes you a, just slowly kind of nicks away at you and makes you a little bit of a worse player. Um, and ultimately like Rashad's still good enough to overcome a lot of that, I think, but you know, or talented enough anyway, but we just haven't really seen him on the field a ton to begin with. Like these injuries, because they, they seem to persist with him and then consistency issues with some of the drops that we saw last year. It's all still pretty concerning to me. He's a talented guy. I like him a lot, but you know, I, I just wouldn't be banking on it. Like I want to get at least a, another professional in there. And if not, I'd like to get a guy on, you know, within the first two days of the draft to challenge him because it feels like whenever the Ravens do try to trust this young talent at receiver, it doesn't work out for them. Why does it always have to be receiver where they do this? Why can't they just kind of 
continue to invest heavily there. And I, I ultimately, I think they will. So, yeah, I think it's, it's also interesting because they bring in a guy like a Michael Gallup and a Josh Reynolds. And obviously Reynolds now is in Denver, so that's not an option anymore, but those are essentially like number three or number four wideouts where it's not a guy that's going to come in and challenge Bateman for Beckham. I think there was always somewhat of a question about like, okay, who is the number two? Who is the number three? It always felt like we never really got a full answer on that because I think they almost kind of rotated in and out of who was the number two or number three wide out. But I'd be all on board for Baltimore trading for a Cortland Sutton type player, like that type of skill set and that type of talent. Now Denver's made it very clear they're not moving them right now, but just that mold essentially where you can have Zay as the number one, that guy is the 2A, and then Bateman is the 2B. It, it just it makes me feel a little more confident. But you talked about the draft class where there are still players like a Keon Coleman or an A.D. Mitchell or if you like speed with Xavier Worthy or some of these guys, they could find a guy in the first couple of days of this draft that could have maybe somewhat similar of an impact to what Zay did last year. Maybe that's just because the offense, it's year two with Todd Monk, and I, I expect things to – look a bit more put together this year, but this, this is a really deep wide receiver group. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned uh Cortland Sutton there because Josh Reynolds, that kind of feels like that would have been the right move. If you were going to go after a guy like that, and where does he <laughs> wind up in Denver behind Cortland Sutton? So of course that's how that works out, but you know, Gallup, he could be a, a good solid option. I feel like he feels space out pretty well. He's, you know, he had some juice. He's had some injuries since then. He, he's probably not quite the same player that he was, but it could be a, a good possession option for you. And he can play the perimeter too, which I think is important about six foot one. So it's good to have that size as well. But overall, I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the diversity in this, uh, this draft class as far as skill sets go with an AD Mitchell and then Keon Coleman and uh, Odunze, some of these bigger guys, maybe not all of them are going to be available to you, but just with how many young kids grow up playing receiver in these wide open offenses. Now it's, it feels like guys that would have gone top 10 are like dropping into the second round these days, you know, 10 years ago versus now. So, yeah, I think the guys are going to be there, and you just got to be willing to uh, to take one of them and continue to invest in this position one way or the other. Yeah, and one guy that I think's picked up a lot of steam recently has been Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina, who I kind of pinpoint him in that, like, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr. range, like first pick of the second round, second pick of the second round in that area. And that kind of begs the question, Jake, of what would you do at pick 30 are you, are you sticking and this obviously depends a lot on the draft board like we don't know who's going to be there at the time if there's a Kyle Hamilton type player who just randomly falls to you I think you got to make that pick but are you okay with them trading back maybe picking up an extra third round pick or a future pick and then them trying to maneuver back up the draft board or I mean the Ravens have nine picks already is that just too many picks for you I mean, I feel like there are certain years where they pick like 14 or 15 guys. So, I mean, nine might be a little bit of a pedestrian number. For, you know. I do expect to see them trade back at least on day you know, two, and maybe it will be day one. And I, I'd honestly be fine with it. It feels like we haven't had that happen with them uh, in a while, really. It feels like they, they used to do it relatively often under Ozzy. Um, but, I mean, with the fact that you're at 30, like you said, it's not like a 14 situation where a trade out of the first round would be pretty, uh, pretty hefty. Like you're pretty much already up into the second round anyway. So I wouldn't hate that. You know, you can still find starters in the second round for year one pretty easily. And like I said, if it's a position like receiver, that's happening all the time these days, regardless. And then I feel like they develop offensive linemen and they scout them very well. So you could probably get a starter along the offensive line on, uh, you know, day two as well. So, you know, I wouldn't hate it. Like you said, it's, it, we're a long way away and we're going to have to see how the board falls, but uh, it's something I definitely wouldn't be surprised to see at all. Yeah, I think Baltimore could go a bunch of different directions with this draft class, but I, I expect a lot of new draft picks coming to Baltimore because I think it's even more so important with Lamar Jackson now on this big contract to hit on those draft picks and obviously hit your veteran free agent signings out of the park. Eric DeCosta did an awesome job of the veteran free agent part of that last year. Let's hope he can replicate it again in 2024. But Jake, I appreciate you. Thanks so much for joining me and talking Ravens. Please tell people where they can find you and what you're working on. Yep. You can find us at exit 52 podcast, wherever you get your shows that's on YouTube, on all podcast platforms. We're at exit 52 podcast across all the social media platforms. And I am at Jake Luke. That's L O U Q U E. I'm recording jumbo set with Spencer uh, once a week where we talk Ravens and then Orioles season's really ramping up. So if you're interested in the O's, uh, we're uh, going to be covering them a bunch here, trying to go live after every series and uh, get a standard episode out for them each week as well. So uh, tune in. 
Baltimore sports is buzzing. The O's, I'm, I'm expecting a big year. Everybody is expecting a big year out of that group. So exciting times in the Baltimore sports world. Jake, I appreciate you again. Jake's work will be in the description below. So be sure to check him out. Give him a follow the whole nine yards. But thank you for tuning in to Locked on Ravens today. Be sure to subscribe here and follow along. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast in audio form, plus in video form, you can hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. For Ravens content five days per week, plus some bonus content in there as well. Coming up tomorrow, more Ravens content. Of course, stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Lockdown Ravens.